It's around the 5th century BC. We are following the life of a young prince. He was born in the Indian subcontinent in present-day Nepal. His life was very peculiar because he only knew luxury and wealth. His parents shielded him from the bad side of life. So he had no clue about old age or diseases or even death. But all that was about to change. At the age of 29, our prince took three chariot rides outside his palace. The blinkers were off. On the first ride, he saw an old person. On the second, he saw a sick person. And on the third, he saw a corpse. You can imagine what it was like. The experience shook the young prince. He abandoned his palace, renounced his wealth, and decided to live the life of an ascetic. Not for long, though. He realized that extreme asceticism was pointless. It just made his body weak. So instead, he chose meditation. And that's when people started to take notice. His teachings gained popularity. His way of life attracted kings. And pretty soon, a new religion took shape, that of Buddhism. And the young prince turned ascetic? Well, he died at the age of 80. History remembers him as Buddha. In modern times, Buddhism has struggled to take root in India. It makes up just 0.7% of the Indian population. But elsewhere, it is thriving, especially in Southeast Asia. So how did Buddhism make its way there? Why did it succeed in Southeast Asia, but not in India? Time for a flashback. At first, Buddhism was localized. It was mostly followed in the Gangetic Plains. This is where Buddha and his disciples preached. But expansion was around the corner. This was a time of religious churn in India. The common people were fed up with Brahminical dogmas. Even kings wanted to break free. So Buddhism became an alternative. By the middle of the 3rd century BC, it got state patronage. The Mauryan king Ashok was in power. He ruled over a massive territory. In the north, it touched the Himalayas. In the south, almost Sri Lanka. So when Ashok converted to Buddhism, it was a huge boost. He sent missions to spread the religion. One of them was to Suvarnabhumi. Now, there's a lot of confusion about it. Some say Suvarnabhumi refers to a place in the Malay Peninsula. Others say it was in Myanmar. The second one, Myanmar, is considered more plausible. Ashok sent Buddhist monks and scriptures to Myanmar. Gradually, the people adopted it. Today, almost 90% of Myanmar's population follows Buddhism. Another Ashokan mission was to Sri Lanka. And this one is more defined. It was led by Ashok's son, Mahendra. He and his colleagues were near the city of Anuradhapura in Sri Lanka. There, they met the Sinhalese king. King Tissa. Mahendra delivered a Buddhist sermon to this king. He was bowled over. He converted to Buddhism, invited the Ashokan mission to his capital and gave them patronage. Thus, Buddhism took root in Sri Lanka. By the 2nd century BC, most Sinhalese had accepted it. Today, more than 70% of the country is Buddhist. Back to India now. When Ashok died, his empire crumbled. Buddhism lost its top supporter. So the expansion hit pause. But then came a new ruler, King Kanishk of the Kushan dynasty. Again, quite a large empire. It covered parts of Central Asia, Afghanistan, and Northwest India. King Kanishk lived between the 1st and 2nd century CE. He supported dif a different school of Buddhism, the Gandhara school. It was a lot different from the Gangetic one. You had more Persian and Greek influences in it. And Kanishk took this Buddhism to Central Asia. It flourished and evolved there. You see, Central Asia had a lot of traditions. You had shamanism, Zoroastrianism, Christianity, all of it intermingled and evolved. So did Buddhism. From Central Asia, Buddhism made a leap, and a very important one, to China. It all started with a peculiar dream. In the first century CE, the Han Emperor saw a flying golden deity. He thought it was the Buddha. So Chinese missions were sent to India. They collected Buddhist texts and took them back to China. These texts were stored in the Han capital. And that's one way Buddhism came to China. The other is the trade routes. You may have heard of the Silk Road. It was a cross-continental trade route of ancient times. It connected Eurasia to East Asia. A lot of things passed through this road. Spices, 
precious metals, paintings, handicrafts, but the most important was ideas. And Buddhism was one such Silk Road idea. Traders took it from Central Asia to China. Back then, China's dominant religion was Taoism. There was a lot of magic and fake science involved. So Buddhism adapted to it. Early Chinese Buddhism also had a lot of magic. Many believe that Buddha was a reincarnation of Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism. Now, these beliefs were refined much later, after the 5th century CE. That's when the Tang Dynasty took over in China. Here, the story of one man stands out. His name was Xuan Zhang. He was a Chinese scholar in the 7th century CE. He learned about Buddhism from his older brother. Soon, Xuan Zhang's interest was picked. He tried to learn Buddhism in Sichuan. Just one problem, though. The Chinese scriptures were not reliable. Too many discrepancies, too many translation errors, and too many mistakes. So Xuan Zhang took a bold decision. He decided to travel to India, but he could not get a permit. So he traveled secretly. First, he entered Central Asia, from there Kashmir, and finally he sailed down to the Gangetic Plains, to the birthplace of Buddhism. Xuan Zhang visited all major Buddhist sites. He also spent a lot of time in Nalanda. It was a major Buddhist monastery in eastern India. Here he learned Sanskrit and Buddhist philosophy. Xuan Zhang spent almost 16 years in India. His return journey was funded by an Indian king. He took back a lot of Buddhist texts and scriptures. Some accounts say 20 horses accompanied him. So Buddhism was now established in China. But it did not stop there. From China, it went to Vietnam and Korea. From Korea, it went to Japan. Of course, this process took a lot of time, around 1,000 years in all. Rulers played an important role in this transmission. Like in Korea, in the 6th century, the Korean king sent a mission to Japan. Many gifts were part of this mission. Among them was an image of Buddha. And this is often cited as Japan's introduction to Buddhism. But the influence hasn't lasted. In China, it has been disrupted by the communists. Korea is now two countries. Again, one of them is communist. And Japan is now largely atheist. Around 86% of their people do not believe in any god. So Buddhism is not thriving in these countries. But it is in Southeast Asia. We look at Indonesia first. An Indian monk took Buddhism there. His name was Gunavarman. He was born in a Kashmiri royal family at the age of 20. He left home to become a monk. First, he traveled down south to Sri Lanka. The island was already Buddhist by then. So Gunavarman became an advisor to the Lankan king. And with his help, he set sail, first to Sumatra and then to Java. In Java, his life was about to change. In the 4th century, Java was ruled by a Hindu king, Vadhaka. Legend says that his mother once dreamt about a holy man arriving on a flying boat. The next day, Gunavarman reached Java. You can guess what happened next. Vadhaka's mother embraced Buddhism. She later convinced her son to do the same. But over the centuries, the religion has disappeared from Indonesia. Most of the country is now Muslim. What was left of Buddhism merged with Hinduism. Thailand had a different experience, though. It's one of the largest Buddhist countries in the world. 95% of their people follow it. But the origin story is confusing. Some Thai scholars say King Ashok spread Buddhism to Thailand. Others say it came from Indonesia. In the 8th century, the Sri Vijaya Empire was ruling over Southeast Asia. Their rulers supported Buddhism. So did the Suryavarman Empire of Cambodia. So Buddhism's expansion was not linear. It happened in different but often simultaneous ways. Buddhism spread from India to Southeast Asia via Myanmar. It also spread to Southeast Asia via Sri Lanka and also via China and Central Asia. These different paths have led to different traditions, different schools of thought, but the basic principles often remain the same, like the cycle of reincarnation or the pursuit of salvation or nirvana. These things are still common. Today, Buddhism is a globally revered religion. It is known for ideas like peace and non-violence. But in the Indian subcontinent, it's fading. There's no consensus on why. Some historians say Buddhism was too tolerant, so when Hinduism got revitalized, it absorbed Buddhism. Others say the monks became corrupt. They were loaded with donations and state gifts, so the monasteries became detached from common people. And the final blow came in the 12th and 13th century. Muslim invaders destroyed multiple Indian monasteries. The Buddhist ones never recovered. It's a story of both success and failure. The success of spreading a religion to dozens of countries and the failure of its disappearance where it was born.